Hello and welcome to Unsupervised Thinking, a podcast on neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and science more broadly. We are a group of computational neuroscientists. I'm Grace. I'm Josh. And I'm Alex. And the topic for this episode is predictive coding. And I'm a little worried about it, but we'll get into that. Um, so as people may have noticed, our usual third chair, Connor, is on podcast sabbatical for a bit. So today we have Alex as our special guest. Alex, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, I'm Alex Kaiko geich I'm a postdoc at UCL, and I study information theory in uh, cerebral cortex. Great. Okay. So as I said, the topic for this episode is predictive coding. This is a topic that none of us really um, work with in our research, but we kind of all thought that we should know more about it or wanted to know more about it. Um, so what we read for that is a, it's an article by Andy Clark, and it's called Whatever Next, Predictive Brains, Situated Agents, and the Future of Cognitive Science. And it was in Behavioral and Brain Sciences in 2013, and it was this kind of special issue thing where they published Andy Clark's essay, and then they published a bunch of responses and rebuttals and uh, kind of further little mini articles on the same topic. And we mostly just read Andy Clark's, but um, have skimmed through some of the rebuttals. So I think that we should start by um, talking about kind of how we all viewed predictive coding maybe before reading this article and what made us want to learn more, but what prevented us from learning more prior to this? Does anyone want to start? I mean, I guess within the context of biological neuroscience, predictive coding doesn't seem to come up as much as it does in like the surrounding literature, like people who would consider themselves philosophers or cognitive scientists um, or cognitive neuroscientists who study humans. I think it's almost maybe like a, a perspective or a framework or like a meta theory that people might approach problems with. Like we've talked a little bit about Bayesian modeling before, and I think it's vaguely analogous in that people like predictive coding isn't a theory so much as it's like a family of theories. Like if you have a specific phenomenon, you might say, oh, maybe the brain is trying to form a prediction of what's going to happen next or what's going to happen in some way. And then you decide to like use that as a perspective uh, when formulating a specific case-by-case model of a certain situation. And I guess I had, I've never really used it directly in my work, but the, the context which I'm at least somewhat familiar with it is at, at one point I, I had studied the retina um, a bit, and there predictive coding is brought up at least in the context of, maybe not predictive coding directly, but there's, there's a view that the retina is trying to compress what it what like the, the the raw image that that gets cast upon the retina the, the the retinal circuits responsibility is at least partly to try to compress that information so that along the optic nerve it can pass only like useful information and so there's something about there being i mean many many different sort of buzzwords have been applied to this like there's an information bottleneck along the optic nerve um, you might want to decorrelate the input so you're passing only the most like surprising or information containing signals and predictive coding is, at least to some extent or another, talked about in the context of the retina, but I think in a mostly vague way. So that was kind of the, the setting that I'd, I'd come to it with. So I um, I don't think I've done anything related to it, except that I've worked on attention, which according to this paper and some other framings of predictive coding, attention is actually very related. But I didn't work on attention with predictive coding in mind. And I would say that a lot of the thing that has scared me about it is this kind of all the associations that it has like there are a lot of philosophers who are really interested in it and like I, i'm not afraid of philosophers but it just kind of is this sense of like why is this area of neuroscience why does it attract such a diverse crowd and why is it associated with all these different things like bayesian stuff and uh, free energy and unsupervised learning and all these things and we'll get into a lot of them but just seemed like there was all this baggage around predictive coding that like if you wanted to get into it you have to like really get into it like you gotta buy into this big framework that's trying to explain the universe and so it kind of uh scared me for a while and i didn't want to to i wasn't sure if i wanted to take that step and i would say reading this hasn't dispelled any of that for me like <laughs> there are a lot of different things talked about in here and there was a lot of big claims about what predictive coding can do um, so, but at least now I have a better sense of exactly what all those are, I suppose. So I, I come more from the theoretical side than the, like way more from the theoretical side than the cognitive side. So I had, I knew about Sophie Deneb's 
work with her pretty pre- predictive spiking model, um, basically, which is uh, related to predictive coding in a very specific way. Uh, and since then, um, I had been seeing predictive coding cited a lot uh, in uh, neuroscience, like uh, neurobiology papers. Um, it was usually just like citing a couple, like this is, like this is um, indicative of predictive coding. Yeah, like people make reference to it a lot, even if it's not like the main way that they're understanding whatever system. They're yeah, studying. exactly. Like it wasn't their main hypothesis. It was just kind of like a shout out to predictive coding. So I didn't really know very much about the field, and I wanted to learn more. Okay, so um, we can start going through kind of some of the claims and the outlines in this paper. They kind of start, so wait, wait, but just just to be clear, like and actually start before we before we go into the details, like we've kind of given some context, but like do we have an operational definition of predictive coding that we're comfortable using for the purposes of this discussion? I mean, we'll, like obviously the whole paper is kind of defining the theory of predictive coding, so we'll get into like all of the different kind of specific, almost corner cases, like this is predictive coding and this is also predictive coding, but currently like we've we kind of said what we thought, but like. Just very concretely, what what do we mean when we say predictive coding? I can tell you what I think it means, and it's rather specific, I suppose, but as a theory should be in my mind. So I think that it's mainly about the idea that in the brain, um, I guess I shouldn't have to start there, but <laughs> in the brain, um, you the there are predictions being made about what uh, perceptual experience is likely to happen. And the brain sends top-down signals to um, lower areas of sensory processing about what it expects those sensory processing areas to encounter. And then uh, comparing what was predicted versus what was actually encountered, an error signal is calculated, and that is the component of the response that is sent forward. So basically you have top-down areas like prefrontal cortex, they would send a signal to parts of the visual system like V4 or IT or something like that, and they would tell those neurons, like, you're about to see a house. And so those neurons that represent houses would, like, I guess, get active or in some way hold on to that prediction, and then an image would appear, and if it wasn't a house, there'd be a big signal that says this was an error. And if it was a house, then no response should be sent on um, from those areas back up to the to the uh, higher areas. And when there is an error, then the system is supposed to learn how to fix itself, either by fixing the mechanisms that predict what you're supposed to see or by fixing the actual bottom-up and uh, top-down uh, connections. So, and just to be clear, I mean, I think that specific case of, like, hierarchical visual processing, there's actually one of the core influential papers, which I think when I was starting to read a lot of neuroscience papers was influential to me, is by Lee and Mumford, which basically lays out specifically this this idea that the process of vision is this hierarchical Bayesian inference, um, where low-level raw sensory inputs are passed on to higher-level areas for further processing, but also top-down signals modulate the lower areas uh, in a way that is, is basically a Bayesian articulation of that hierarchical predictive coding scheme for vision. So from my standpoint, I, I think it's possibly a bit broader of a definition. I don't think it's restricted. So I mean, I think in, clearly in the way that it's going to be presented in the paper, and we'll get to this, they actually use it as essentially like, you know, people talk about this in the responses, like a grand unified theory of the brain. Like this it's supposed to be comprehensive and totalizing and, and like predictive coding is supposed to explain everything. But I, I'm comfortable with a slightly more general and vague not quite theory. Like, I'm not saying this is Andy Clark's view, but like, I, I think I'm personally comfortable with just viewing predictive coding as, in most cases, a somewhat underspecified theory, where it's, it's more like predictive coding is the general view that the brain, in any of a number of specific settings, makes predictions about what it's going to see. And those predictions could be uh, based on evolutionary history, it could be based on learning, it could be hard-coded into the wiring of a microcircuit, like through learning or evolution, or it could be something that comes from a, a higher level area. But the upshot is that in a given specific case, the job of a certain brain area is to produce a prediction of what's going on. And that's supposed to make coding possibly more efficient, 
make selecting what to do easier. Um, or like there's, there's obviously a, a number of things you could do with predictions, the simplest of which is basically just to compress what you pass along when, when trying to represent things, like when trying to represent sensory stimuli. So I, I'm fine with, I think, a, a slightly more general version than, than you've articulated. I think the paper kind of jumps between these two, like the very specific version that Grace gave and then the more general interpretation. I mean, I don't think anything that you said was very controversial, that there's some like prior um, and higher areas of the brain and there's like top-down signals that carry that prior through in some way that's not very well specified. I almost think that we should have like kind of a chalmers kind of hard predictive coding and soft predictive coding. Oh, I like that. Or like hard predictive coding. Well, I don't know which one you guys think should be which, but maybe hard predictive coding is like the one that Grace said, where it's very specifically that the bottom up signals are representing uh, error from the predictions that are coming top down. Uh, and then the soft predictive coding could be that it's Bayesian. Well, okay, so I like that categorization. Maybe at this point we should lay out what we mean by Bayesian. We <laughs> had a previous um, episode where we talked about the use of um, Bayesian modeling in psychology. But so I guess in this case, so generally in Bayesian modeling, I think there are two components that people consider key for something to be quote unquote Bayesian. One is that you have a prior, so you have some belief that is not related to the exact evidence you're witnessing in a moment that tells you what you kind of expect to see. It tells you like what's normal. And then you combine that with evidence that you get in the moment to like form your final judgment about what's happening. So that's one thing, having a prior. And then the second thing is that there be distributions. So your prior isn't just, I think that there's a cat. It's, I think, you know, with 50% probability there's a cat and 20% there's a dog. And so you have a distribution over possible options. So I think those are the two features that people usually associate with Bayesian. And the prior, I see how that plays into um, predictive coding, if you consider the prior as your prediction about what you think you'll see. And the uncertainty distribution seems, you know, you could have it if you want. You can always throw in an uncertainty distribution. And some people like to talk about whether the brain is representing uncertainty in certain ways. Um, but it doesn't seem core to predictive coding to me in any way. So I, I, I kind of would like to, to contradict this and say that there being a representation of uncertainty, I think, is, is probably rather core to any kind of predictive coding model. And... So like in machine learning, there's a notion like it comes up in the simplest case or one of the simpler cases as like common filtering. Um, but so generally, let's say filtering, where basically as a like over time, you at each time, at each moment in time, you are you have a prediction that's based on what happened in the previous moments in time. And you combine that prediction and whatever model you have of how those influence the present coupled with whatever observations you get at the at the present moment. And basically the spirit of the point is like, how much do you weight your prior versus what you just observed? And so there's, there always has to be, if, there, if you are integrating information between what you currently are observing and your priors, your, your, your predictions about like of the present from the past, you need to know how strongly should I weight the current information versus the past information. And the like, Basically, the consistent way of doing that is to use probability distributions for how confident you are based on your prior versus how strongly or how confident you are about your current observations. And like you, you know, there, there's at least a, a reasonable case to be made that like you should weight things based on how certain you are about them. So if you're really certain about the current observations and you're quite uncertain about your predictions or prior information, then you should mostly trust the, cur the current observation and vice versa. Um, and so I think that like anything that involves making predictions and integrating evidence with current observations, like there's a pretty clear case to be made for that computation to involve notions of uncertainty. And if, if you don't do it that way, it's, it's almost like you're just choosing to not focus on like an obviously reasonable way of thinking about that. Well, that doesn't mean that that's not what's happening. <laughs> um, okay, so let's say for the sake of Josh's argument, that to do predictive coding in a reasonable way, there has to be Bayesian stuff involved. Uh, I'll allow that. <laughs> but the connection between Bayesian stuff and predictive coding seems to be so strong that you would think that anytime you're doing something Bayesian, you're doing predictive coding. 
And I don't know if I agree with that, but that might be because of my sense of what predictive coding means, where you have to have a very clear top-down signal, and the only thing that's passed forward is the error signal and that kind of thing. I think you can have a system that does Bayesian shit without it having those properties that are, in my mind, synonymous with predictive coding. I don't know. I don't really... I have to think about it more, what you said, basically. But I don't... I feel like you're making an argument about the right way to do something as opposed to like how the brain might implement something. I mean, I think that that's like an interesting critique. And I think that that's like valid for like most of these meta theories. I mean, like, again, I'm not thinking about this as a, like, I'm not thinking about all of like, so we can, we, we can get into this. And this is one of the specific subsections of this paper basically is, is there even evidence from neuroscience that the brain is doing predictive coding? And like, I think a lot of this is, is kind of philosophical. Right? It's like borderline normative. It's like saying a reasonable thing that the brain could be doing and maybe should be doing is making predictions about things. But that's the difference between the two kind of um, the two types of predictive coding that they're talking about in the article, right? Because if you're talking about the feed forward um, signal being error, then that that's a very strong hypothesis that you have. Whereas if you're talking the, from what you were saying basically, um, that yeah, that's just kind of a way to interpret your data maybe. Yeah, and it does seem like, so I would say that the paper doesn't make a clear distinction between the hard and soft, but I think that we should continue to make a distinction between that. Um, so like, let's, so what is the distinction precisely? Hard is what I think predictive coding is. Where so you, you so have a we're using down. hard to refer to like a specific mechanism. I think it's the original mechanism, the one that, he, that starts with, with uh, the Rao just Rao. And, yeah. yeah, exactly, that paper. Yeah, so there was a paper in 1999 by Rao and Ballard that introduced this hierarchical predictive coding model, which is basically the idea that you have a top-down signal that predicts what should be happening in lower areas, and uh, then an error signal is computed in those lower areas and sent forth. So that is, I think, one of the earliest citations about this um, unless you're counting kind of more vaguer, more philosophical things that are talked about in earlier times. Um, and so I think it's reasonable that that should at least be one model that we consider as the definition of predictive coding, or this other one that kind of more describes the emergent behavior of a system in some way, or kind of general design properties you'd want to think about. But that seems like a very just so story to me. Like it kind of also how when you talk about whether the brain is optimal or not, it's like, yeah, it's optimal for some cost function. And then the game then is what is the cost function? Yeah, so here then it's like the game is like, what is uh, what is the expectation or what is it predicting? And you can always find something that it's predicting where then what the, t- the bottom up looks like an error signal. Yes, I agree. So, I mean, if I try to rephrase this, the, the concern is that like you could specify any you could claim in retrospect that like most data that is observed from the brain, there exists an explanation formulated as predictive coding yes. that, that is consistent with that data. Yeah. But some of those some of those explanations might be kind of clunky, right? Basically, it would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So like in order to say, like if you, you observe some data and it's not superficially like or, or first order, it's not obvious that it's consistent with predictive coding, but you can kind of make up a narrative whereby predictive coding still kind of explains that data, but it might be like a complicated narrative. And so, I mean, I, I, like I agree. And I mean, this is why I feel like it, it almost is more of like a meta theory. And I, so I don't, I don't mean that in like an excuse kind of like, I'm not trying to like excuse predictive coding from the rigors of science, but it's, it's, almost, like a, it's almost like a statement about the kinds of specific models that you might produce. It's, it's not very sensible to say like, is the brain Bayesian? But people do ask that. <laughs> yeah, people ask. I, That's the title of books. Yeah, <laughs> papers. So and... I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to defend that either. But like, that doesn't mean that like in specific cases it isn't useful to formulate Bayesian models and fit them to either psychophysics or neural data. So that way you're using that sort of framework as a way of ex- a way of understanding the value. Like certain observations can be explained in terms of basically models, specific models that are implemented from the perspective of a certain framework. And so like, it may be the case, it may not be the case, right? I mean, this is, this is, this is the part that's purely science. It may be the case that coming from the perspective of predictive coding allows you to formulate concise models that may, that, that match certain specific neural data in certain cases. And then that you would say, oh, predictive coding afforded me the ability to articulate like a useful model in a certain case. 
And that, like, that, that's an empirical question, whether or not that's true. It's almost like the discussions around predictive coding and, and to whether it's valuable or not should depend on those specific cases. But there's also like, I don't know, philosophers have kind of an aesthetic pleasure that they derive from like arguing for or against certain kind of almost meta theories. So like this is a perspective that, you know, people are trying to claim, oh yeah, it's got some utility, right? Yeah, but then it's not really a scientific theory, is it? Well, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we're reading, well, I mean, a, we're reading a paper by a philosopher. A scientific, yeah, yeah. yeah, we are. We're reading yeah. a paper by a philosopher. Andy Clark is a professor of logic and metaphysics. So that seems relevant to this discussion. So, I mean, this, the, but this gets at it at, at a deeper level, which is like, what kinds of statements can one make that are, like, it, it's, it's, it's almost like a philosophy of science argument. I, I mean, it shouldn't be. I think we're, we're scientists, and so we're coming at this from the perspective of like, well, if you're saying that predictive coding is a scientific theory of the brain, then it should make specific predictions, and it should be a specific model that we can falsify or not. And like, that's, I think, a generally reasonable view. But I'm, I'm trying to be sympathetic to it, its value from the perspective, like, especially in this paper, being advocated for by like, a, the person who's not a practicing scientist, right? And so coming from the perspective of philosophy, maybe, right, the value of it is that it, uh, it structures your thinking about a certain set of models that you could formulate and then could test. I didn't have a specific, highly articulate notion when I was saying, like, meta theory, but the sense in which it's kind of a meta theory is it's not a specific model of a specific brain region, though there are people who have, like, derived, if I use the word very loosely, like, derived specific models of specific brain areas in the scheme of predictive coding. But it's, it's something that it's like a perspective or a framework that allows you to like articulate specific models for, for specific cases. And I, I don't know, thought about from like, at least that's the level of generality that this paper is coming to it with. Now we could just say like, that's not a reasonable thing to do in science. But I mean, I think, you know, using math or like there are a whole bunch of theoretical neuroscientists come at neuroscience from the perspective of like statistical physics. And so, like, the idea that you would use any models from statistical physics to, like, make models of specific brain areas or predictions about specific brain areas entails some sort of, like, philosophical baggage. And I feel like maybe this is like that or like Bayesian kinds of uh, models. Yeah, I agree with that. And I was going to make a similar kind of argument that I use a lot of information theory in my work. Um, I don't necessarily think that the brain is implementing information theory in a strong way, but it's a useful way to uh, generate models and uh, to generate ideas and hypotheses and to analyze uh, models. Yeah, I agree that thinking about the predictive powers of the brain will help you understand things probably in certain circumstances. Um, but I want to talk again about this hard version where we think that error signals are being sent and there are top-down predictions, because even within that strict formulation, I have a lot of issues with it. I think that it's inconsistent, sometimes internally and sometimes with the data. Um, okay, so let's get to this, right? So yeah, I mean, there's a number of specific points. We can start possibly a little bit out of order with like, is there evidence for uh, predictive coding in the visual system? Specifically, this notion that like, a prediction is made, and instead of a lower level brain area communicating like the raw sensory information to a higher brain area, it instead only conveys the difference or error between the prediction that the top down area, the, like the top down message provides that low level area, and the raw data. So, like basically, if you're if you're like expecting to see something, and then you see something slightly different. You, your brain, the, low, the lower level areas of your brain, only communicate to higher level areas of the brain the part of that stimulus that violated your expectation, for example. Right? So this, this could be over time or arguably over space. Um, but so like, it would be like the idea like, you know, if, you, if you're looking at something that's like a screen that's blank and then like something flashes on the screen, right? You kind of had a prediction that the screen was going to remain blank in some very colloquial way. And... Uh, when the screen for a moment flashed something that like surprised you, violated your expectations. And so your brain was like not sending and your lo the lower level areas of your brain were not sending anything to the higher level areas of your brain because your high level, the higher level areas of your brain were like 
basically sending top-down signals to lower level areas like the screen's blank the screen's blank don't expect to see anything but then when you saw something the lower level areas had to like shout at the higher level areas oh but i just saw something and so they have to like basically tell the high level areas you actually saw something it's it's you know it's not just a blank screen even though the high level areas had this prediction but this is kind of a crazy theory because then it's saying that when you're looking at a blank screen there's nothing happening in your visual cortex is that basically what it's saying I think no. So I think the idea would be that if you're looking at a blank screen and um, you know it's been blank for a while, you've yeah, gotten long used enough. to being in that situation, and so your predictive part of your brain might assume that it will continue to be that way. It doesn't have to. That would probably depend on previous experience of when you sat and stared at blank screens. But you might there some part of your brain is predicting that nothing will happen in the future, and so it's. It's not saying that nothing's hitting your retina or hitting your visual system. It's saying that what's hitting your visual system is being predicted by higher areas in your brain. And so your visual system shouldn't be talking because there's nothing new to, to No, but that's set. what I'm saying is okay. that then it, if you've looked at it for long enough, then then there's no error signal being propagated but it, it doesn't upstream. Have, so I, I, I agree. But so like the simplest case would be like something on a screen. But let's say like, you like I mean, I'm not, I'm not good at producing stimuli like on demand. Like you always have like a stimuli that's like goes from low pitch to high pitch, like I don't know, boo, or something like that, and you always hear that stimuli, right? We could have imagined our own. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but you you have this stimuli that goes from low pitch to high pitch, and it happens like fifty times in a row, right? And then you hear the first half of it, and the, like under predictive coding model, upon hearing the first half of that stimuli, you would your brain would already somewhere in your brain there would be like a firing of neurons consistent with your expectation that it's going to end with the high pitch part of it or something like this. And um, roughly the statement would be if, for example, the stimulus ended midway through it, so the stimulus didn't finish, it just like went to silence midway through it, or uh, the stimulus were a totally different stimulus, like you, you, like you heard at some regular interval this exact same thing, and then you were expecting to hear it, and you heard something very different, your brain would register via surprise, like, I mean, like, you would basically get a surprise signal or an error signal that um, was large and encoded a lot of information, expressing the deviation from the prediction that you had. So under any of these circumstances. But how do you disentangle that from just, from salience? Well, so I think something that's weird about predictive coding is that if you kept hearing this sound over and over, your auditory system shouldn't be doing anything. By the time you get used to it and could predict that it was going to keep happening, there should be like no signal in your auditory system because there's no error to be propagated. And I don't think salience models say that. They say that there's always a signal that's coming through because yeah. you're, all, you're still hearing something. There's still something that's hitting your ear and being transmitted by your, your auditory system. Whereas predictive coding says that, no, if you predicted it, the, if there's no error signal, then there's no message being sent bottom up through your auditory system. And this is exactly what I'm saying with the visual system. Like, if doesn't this predict then that if you put someone into an fMRI for a long period of time, and they don't have any stimulus. I mean, it's kind of a similar thing where then there's no air signal to be Yeah, there'd be no air signal, so nothing would be going forward. But, but it doesn't have to even be it, that there's no stimulus. It's just if they have to see yeah, the same yeah. stimulus yeah. over and over. I, I but it would guys, have to be the same stationary stimulus because you could always say that any change in the temporal yeah. properties is, 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 something is you a could prediction. Or could, yes, and then exactly. that's where this starts to be not so falsifiable anymore. So, but I, I think you guys are being a little too, like... Uh, Scientific? No, no, like overly specific in your interpretation of what this means right like you're saying if you were there long enough you would have your brain would be doing nothing which is like true but what's long enough right you've been alive for no but but the point is you've been alive for a very long time the the idea would be like you could be in a room and it could be quiet for two days and you could have your eyes it could be like in a sensory deprivation tank for two days and because your nervous system through evolution, which also informs some of the priors that we're talking about, and uh, through your entire life's worth of experience, does not expect things to remain silent. You, you, would, you would still not go to like a silent brain, even for like two days. Even your brain, if you were reared in like sensory deprivation land, you would still not have a perfect prediction that it was going to remain silent because your brain was evolved with certain expectations or priors about what kind of stimuli you would see. 
I kind of feel like if it's evolved, that it's not a very interesting form of predictive coding and it's just hardwired. I think it also make, it goes back to your earlier point that it's not falsifiable. It's the same way as just finding what you know the cost function is yeah. in something yeah, yeah. Bayesian to say that you're optimal. It's like, oh, it's predictive if the prediction means... You know, in this experiment, prediction is on an evolutionary time scale, but in this other experiment, prediction is on the last three seconds of what you saw. And I think these these are the criticisms that people also apply to Bayesian quote just quote unquote just so stories, right? So like for anything the brain is doing, you can invent an objective function or a prior distribution that explains why that what the brain is doing now is kind of optimal. And I think there's a similar flexibility. Uh, this is, then I think this is very much deviating from Andy Clark's, you know, view. But this is why it's not so much like a specific model. It's more like a perspective or a framework for formulating specific models. Can I go on to criticisms of it as a specific model? Because, sure. Yeah, of course. So in the paper, they cite some um, studies that are meant to support the notion that predictive coding is happening in the brain. And one of them is this study where... Um, they're recording from an uh, area in the brain that responds strongly to faces. It's called FFA. And um, they basically say that if a person is expecting to see a face, this area is very active. And if you're expecting to see a face and you don't see a face, the area is still active. And if you're expecting to see a face and you do see a face, it has the same level of activity. So they're claiming, and I don't know if this is consistent with all uh, studies on FFA, but they're claiming that there's no difference between the activity in this area if you're expecting to see a face uh, and you do versus if you're expecting to see it and you don't. So that would mean this obviously can't be like part of the visual hierarchy because if you were expecting to see a face and you saw one, this area shouldn't be active at all. And if you were expecting to see a face and you didn't, it should be very active. So the, the fact that it's the same regardless of what you saw, this means that this area is somehow encoding the prediction, I assume. This is supposed to be an area that tells you what you're predicting to see and sends that signal to lower areas. But they also say that if you're not expecting to see a face and you see one, this area has a strong response. And if you're not expecting to see a face and you don't see one, it doesn't have a large response. So that's completely inconsistent with it being the prediction area because the prediction wouldn't change. You're not expecting to see a face, so this area should remain silent even if you see a face if it's just storing the prediction. So I feel like even in their attempt to claim evidence, there's like a huge flaw. I, I, I'm Again, I'm not like a staunch advocate of predictive coding, so I don't really want to defend it in this specific case. But I, I mean, the, the, the caveats that I will say is like obvious. fMRI is a very coarse level of, of uh, observation of the brain. People talk about the cortical microcircuit, and in a given region of any kind of sensory cortex, one model that's hypothesized for what's going on is that part of the cortical microcircuit is representing the stimulus, and other parts of the cortical microcircuit essentially represent uh, the difference between predictions from other parts of cortex or predictions from higher parts of cortex and the raw sensory stimulus. So that, that, is, that is a fairly conventional model of, of, uh, of a cortical microcircuit. And under that model, you would expect that both the sensory stimulus itself and the error signal would be represented. Yeah, they call this, in this paper, they call it the duplex model. And they kind of just slip it in as a, a, like an alternative form of predictive coding where you would actually still see um, signals in different areas and you kind of need to see the signal. If you're going to have a prediction that goes from the top, some top area down, then you would see that prediction signal at least everywhere and it would need to like remain and be constant. And so, you know, that area of the brain could quote unquote light up because of the predictive signal. But then you could still make, you know, hypotheses that are based on that and are still falsifiable. Um, and yeah, it also... And specifically in the case of like the FFA, just to, to finish this, this like point, right? In the case of the FFA, if parts of the microcircuit underlying the, you know, the FFA are responding to faces and other parts of it are responding to deviations in expectation of whether you're seeing a face or not, like at the coarse level of resolution of fMRI, you would maybe, your hypothesis would be, if you see a face or if there's a violation in your expectation, you would expect that brain region to be active because parts of the cortical microcircuit circuit would right, become active in different cases. I think fMRI is like a, is because it's so coarse, doesn't necessarily finely differentiate between specific 
notions of representation versus prediction, especially if under the lax version of predictive coding, predictions are made, but the, like the brain would still represent the stimulus and the brain would also represent the error signal and the brain would communicate the error signal to other regions or something like this. But that gets into the question then to me of if this is more efficient, because that's something that's cited as a benefit of predictive coding. If you only have to represent and send the error, then you're being more efficient. But if you also have to keep replicating this prediction in different forms as you pass it from a higher level to a lower level and hold that representation in place while you do this error calculation, then it's not clear to me that it's more efficient. The version of it that seems more efficient is the one that you were referencing earlier, Josh, about the retina, where that's not comparing anything to a top-down prediction. It's just kind of compressing the representation um, based on like statistics about the whatever stimulus that brain area is used to processing, which is slightly different, but still talked about in terms of predictive coding. So then can we talk about the receptive fields, since that's something, um, since you're complaining about fMRI, basically, not being uh, resolved enough? Well, I'm, I'm complaining about it. But well, yeah. I, yeah, well for, our, our interpre- <laughs> <laughs> for our interpretation of fMRI in the context of predictive coding. So can we, so then let's talk about receptive fields. Go ahead. And, okay. what, what? So basically he was saying that receptive fields in um, basically you see retinal ganglion cells that have center surround receptive fields. And he was saying that this is because there's a prediction that it's uniform in that receptive field region. And so anything that's not uniform is, that's the error, which. Yeah. So this, so just to, just to be very clear what this, essentially what this kind of model is saying is that like the expectation at the level of the retina for what's going on is like a uniform field. Like everything you see is like the same color or intensity. And so one notion of what compression could be for the retina would be like, basically you don't send any signal for anywhere where like, it's basically a blank field of view. Um, and you, you only send signals along the optic nerve um, that correspond to areas in your visual field that have something going on where it's like not blank. Right? That's, that's roughly the statement. But first of all, that's ignoring higher order statistics in natural scenes, of which we know there are a lot. So it seems like it wouldn't even just be this like radially symmetric center surround receptive field anyway. Uh, and yeah, that's my only thing. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it also is, as I was saying, it, it's not the top down version of predictive coding. This is a completely local computation that has nothing to do with what you predict yeah. on some more interesting time scale like if i predict to see someone in a crowd this doesn't speak to that at all this the retina doesn't get top down predictions that would tell it what to expect to see well okay, that, so- i think you but you can make the same argument in lgn which also has very similar receptive fields and i don't really know why he, he didn't say that instead of the, like oh because you could get top down because you I mean, because, yeah exactly because you get yeah. you get top down you get feedback there and then you do have similar like on uh, center surrounds receptive fields there one view of the retina that has motivated theory about the retina is that like because there's the optic nerve you've got this retina that's got a bunch of neurons and then you have to like condense the information locally in the retina and pass it along this bottleneck of the optic nerve to get to the rest of the brain so like in the rest of the brain it may or may not be the case that like when communicating information you want to communicate with like as much efficiency and compression as possible maybe that's true in the rest of the brain maybe it's not but it's unambiguous, according to you know a certain view, that in the retina, what you want to communicate from the retina to the brain needs to be compressed. Sure, that's very interesting, but that has nothing to do with predictive coding. It has something to do with predictive coding, right? So like the- it has something to do with the soft form of predictive sure. coding that just says you should generally consider what you what is likely true when you process information. Okay, so yeah, yeah I mean, ag- ignoring- or evolutionary predictive. Coding, sure. There's no way for that signal to get there. Yeah. So ig- ignoring the sort of strict requirements, I'll, I'll say strict. It, you can decide whether they're strict or not. But ignoring the sort of strict requirement that there be like explicit learning of these signals or top-down communication of these signals. If you tolerate that, like your prior could be informed uh, by evolution or whatever, reasonable retinas on evolutionary timescales should have evolved to compress the kind of information that's likely to hit the retina. So like people who study the retina using a combination of, you know, computational neuroscience and uh, like efficient coding principles, they, they do they do look at the retina as a pretty clear case where you can demonstrate that like compression is occurring. The retina is doing things that 
under certain assumptions are relatively reasonable and optimal. And it pertains to predictive coding in the certain weak sense, like the generalized sense that like you're compressing information and the way you compress information is obviously by not coding the information that you should be able to predict. It's the same as how they compress videos to send them like to TVs and stuff. Yeah, you exactly. only send the difference in a frame compared to the frame before because most frames, everything's the same or, you know, 99% of the pixels are the same. So you only send the difference. So across, so, and then there's, and the two basic kinds of prediction you can be making is like across time, I expect at this moment things to look mostly like they did at a moment ago. And another kind of prediction you can make is across space. Like if I've seen most of the visual field, but I have not observed a specific part of it, then I expect that that specific part is basically gonna look like all of its neighboring pixels or whatever. I'm not gonna get more into how this is not the same predictive coding that seems the, the relevant one where you yeah, actually so this is, make a real prediction and not just statistically what's the efficient way to represent Yeah, so this, this is about like efficient coding, which is like... Which isn't different. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it could be in the case. And so this is the, the somewhat strange thing to me. So like if the original paper about predictive coding um, was in 1999, like it's been a while, you know, there, you would expect there to be more direct tests of the version of predictive coding that was presented in that paper, which is this top down, you're predicting an error and sending up uh, error signals. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of experimental evidence for that version. And you could do that easily, even in V1, with a stimulus that is just exactly the same. Like you have the animal or person fixate and you show them the exact same sequence of images over and over and over, like A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. So they should be able to predict exactly what will hit their retina and their early visual areas and all of that uh, perfectly well. And then see if there are still any signals that get sent from those areas or if it goes away completely. I think Michael Berry just had a presentation about this, right, in, in Cosine. He has a, there's a paper, I think it might be on, I don't remember if it's published or on the archive, but they're basically exactly doing that. And then they have like a, a novel image at some point, and they show that there's like a big response to that kind of salience. Yes. And this is in Salamander Retina? Or? I don't remember. It, it was Michael Berry's lab, right? Yeah, so probably. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I agree that there are... There are some studies that do that, and you do see that if you keep presenting the same thing over and over, you get what's usually called adaptation, which some people attribute still to purely bottom-up uh, connections kind of not being as strong because they've been repeatedly activated or something like that, yeah. something that doesn't have to do with a top-down prediction being sent. There are other ways to explain why the response to repeated stimulus decreases, um, and then Similarly, there are some ways to explain why the response to a novel stimulus would be very strong. And they could or they could not have to do with predictive coding models. And but so it seems like there should just be more experiments that are exactly about that and compare different models to see what best explains the data. But this seems like the fundamental problem, again, of it not really being falsifiable, because then you can't distinguish that between um, what you were saying you could just have in like single cells, right? Um, well, adapting in, or or being in the, know, salient like, responses. But then on the other side, you also, because from Josh's argument, it could just have been evolved, even if you don't see that. So it seems like there's no way oh, to actually sure, test this is the problem. But if we put a pin in Josh's ideas, <laughs> um, I still think that there are concrete predictions that could be made if someone just posited a concrete model that's based on this. Just So in this like duplex model, there are cells that represent the top-down prediction. Those cells should be active before the stimulus arrives because they are predicting its presence. There should be other cells that are not active if this predicted stimulus occurs and are active if it doesn't occur and send on. And those cells that have this error signal should be the ones that go on to other areas. And the ones that have the prediction signal should be the ones that don't go on to other areas. And I think I've seen one paper try to make that claim and I don't know how well the evidence really supported it. So yeah. Uh I mean, I think you're right. Uh, basically, I agree with you that, like, in order to test this, you could test it directly. And in order to test this, you would have to make very specific formulations of what you mean by predictive coding and what you would expect to see. And, like, I also don't mean to imply that there are no distinctions between, like, efficient coding, which goes back, like, longer than this, you know, predictive coding paper in 1999 and predictive coding. Where there's, like, a bunch of these ideas. And I feel like they're largely related. 
And I feel like this review, um, the one that we're talking about today by Andy Clark, talks about predictive coding specifically without necessarily talking about like its intellectual siblings. Like efficient coding is pr like from a certain standpoint is pretty related to predictive coding. There are ways that predictive coding seems reasonable. Mathematically, it like is sensible to say things like you should combine your predictions with observations and that you can do things like efficiently code if you do that. Um, so I'm coming at it more from like, let's say a bit of a normative perspective that there's like something reasonable about approaching the brain with the perspective that it might in some cases do things like this. Oh yeah, I think it's reasonable and I'm kind of surprised by how harsh I've been this whole time. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because I think there's, yeah, I obviously we make predictions. Like the fact that we can be surprised by things. Our brains are predicting stuff all the time. There's like the famous example of like, you think that your milk carton is full, but like your roommate drank it all and you go to pick it up and your hand goes flying because you had like prepared yourself to pick up something heavy and it was actually light. Like those kinds of weird things that happen are because we're doing predictions and they are important for how we process information. And the fact that you can kind of, you know, have mini hallucinations and stuff because you were expecting to see something that you didn't see. Like this is happening. It's just exactly so, yeah, how so is it happening? And what I have a problem with is the i think the okay, but idea like, wait, but just to be clear like so you are accepting at some level of resolution that like some of this is kind of obvious right it's like yeah it's, but i'm interested in how the brain implements things and i don't know that this presentation of how it's implemented aligns with the data and so i want just to have a clear data based argument about whether it's a reasonable thing to assume and it just it doesn't seem like it aligns so i don't know why there's a focus on it so much I think we all agreed that it was very reasonable as um, in the con like as a contextual idea, but the specific idea of the error signal being the feed forward kind of bottom exactly. up, that's what we don't really, well, Grace and okay. I don't agree with. So fine. So, I mean, if we get very concrete just to sort of summarize where we feel like we're at right now, it's obvious that the brain is making predictions from like a philosophical or like a broadly cognitive level. It's clear that like humans and other animals make predictions about lots of different things at lots of different time scales and sort of spatial scales. And the question then is, does predictive coding offer concrete and not yet proven wrong predictions about the brain? So like the question is, where can predictive coding be tied to neural mechanism? And like, where has it not already been falsified based on existing data? I think a lot of the areas that it's claiming to have predictive power in, it's kind of been falsified. I mean, you can always like, oh, well, that exact experiment didn't, you know, test for exactly the right thing and like kind of shoehorn the argument in in some way. But there's just there's very obviously not strong, strong evidence for it because then it would be the dominant paradigm. And it's not exactly a dominant paradigm. And I feel like there is this weird like in this paper multiple times. And I've heard this before, like they want to downplay the role of feed-forward connections. Predictive coding is all about top-down feedback prediction, uh, prediction signals, and so it really emphasizes that part of the anatomy. But even within predictive coding, the feed-forward aspect is just as important because that's how you calculate the error signal. You need to actually process the information you're getting in a given moment to compare it to your prediction. So it's just as important as the top-down signal. And a lot of the history of neuroscience, and particularly visual neuroscience and that kind of thing, has focused on feed-forward um, processing because it's in, one, in some ways easier to study. And I think that's something that like people who are advocates of predictive coding don't like, and they want to talk about the, the top-down signals. But to me, it makes sense that you kind of, you know, get the bottom-up stuff first, and you know, try to understand that as well as you can, and then see how it can be modulated by top-down things. Well, you can measure it is one thing. I can't measure someone's prior or their prediction. It's much harder, certainly, yeah. <laughs> and like, okay, so you, you mentioned earlier something like adaptation or habituation versus sensitization. Like, things being, like, there are other mechanisms to explain why a signal can be high when you're surprised, or there are other mechanisms to explain why the signal decreases when you are, like, s exposed to the same stimulus repeatedly. And like, you can say, oh, it's not that you're canceling a prediction, it's just adaptation. But like adaptation, to some extent, is a like a candidate implementation level mechanism for... For a particular type of prediction, but not the general type that I think this model sometimes claims to be able to explain. 
And also, again, I'm interested in implementation, and they're positing a slightly different implementation model than but local ones. It could also just be like neurotransmitter depletion. Yeah, but you could argue, well, that's where the prediction happens. Yeah, well, but something. then everything is yeah. prediction, like predictions mm-hmm. evolved into us. Yeah, but can I make a really quick gripe for a second? I don't necessarily have that much to say about this, but did you see anywhere that they mentioned cerebellum in this paper? Because that's one area where there is very strong evidence yeah. that yeah, yeah. there's predictive coding in like... Okay, so, so so defend predictive coding then in the context of the cerebellum. So one of the, <laughs> the major theories of cerebellum is that it's um, encoding the sensory consequences of your planned actions. And there's strong evidence that climbing fiber inputs to the Rakinji cells are encoding error. I really hate cerebellum vocabulary. Why do you hate cerebellum vocabulary? Because I can never remember it all. <laughs> Sorry. Go the ahead. climbing fiber is the one that climbs. <laughs> Done. Uh, yeah. Well, like the example that Grace gave is a very common example where you're like uh, holding a book or something. And if somebody takes something off, you have to have a force upwards to balance like the book or the glass that you're holding. And then when someone removes it, then you have... Like while your eyes are closed. It's yeah, like, or while you're not looking. Yeah. yeah. Um, then then suddenly there's a change in the force uh, that's being pressed against your hand. Uh, and so then you your hand goes up because you haven't compensated for that. So should we venture into free energy and the free energy principle that is related to predictive coding in a certain way? Kind of. So Grace, why don't you give us a little bit of an introduction to the free energy principle? Thanks, Josh. I'll try. <laughs> so from what I could gather, the, um, the free energy formulation, uh, that's the section heading in this review article, is kind of trying to extend this idea, this intuition, that the brain is trying to reduce prediction error. So basically, like, in predictive coding, the idea is that you tune your predictive powers and your sensory system such that, you know, you shouldn't have a lot of surprise. You should be able to predict uh, what's happening and what perceptions are going to kind of reach your brain. Um, This extends that to like the whole organism in the sense that the behavior of the organism should also try to reduce prediction error. So uh, organisms should control their bodies and their behavior in a way that they won't experience I, I think you're not supposed to say so they won't experience surprise, but that kind of is what it feels like because they're not supposed to experience prediction error. And um, there are caveats that they describe in here about why that's not the same as surprise exactly and why even in uh, this model you wouldn't just sit in a dark room all the time, even though that would be a really good way of reducing your prediction error. Um, there's some meta expectation that presumably on an evolutionary time scale, the animal is supposed to have that it will explore and experience new things. And so if you don't explore, then you're violating the prediction that you had that you would explore. And so uh, that's a way to get around the idea that the free energy formulation would say that you just should never do anything because that's the easiest way to reduce prediction error. So, I mean, okay, you guys earlier decided you want to introduce the notion of like a hard versus soft, where you meant by hard like a specific example and by soft, some sort of more fuzzy example. But I think that the somewhat more relevant division to me is the difference between uh, what I'll call strong and weak predictive coding. So strong predictive coding is the claim that predictive coding is like the mechanism responsible for everything. And weak is like, in some parts of the brain, predictive coding is like probably happening to some extent. Whereas you guys came into this paper with like more neuroscience perspective and were saying like, is it proposing a specific neuro- neurobiological mechanism that we can test and falsify? And I, and I feel like this paper was more like, how true is predictive coding? Not, is, it, is there a specific mechanism associated with it? And how true without it being a specific mechanism is the kind of question that scientists don't ask, right? Like, you guys are scientists, so you're coming at it and saying... Well, if there's not a specific mechanism, then it's irrelevant to argue whether it's true or not. And no, I'm just saying that if it's true or not, to me, means falsifiable or not. Because other than that, I can't distinguish, right? Other than that, it seems like it's just faith. Yeah, and those are separate things. You don't have to have the exact mechanism to have it be falsifiable by some definition. And you could say that like there are people who believe in predictive coding who don't care about free energy. And so there is a division there where 
um, if you believe that predictive coding has explanatory power, that doesn't mean you have it, you believe that it has explanatory power in everything in the universe, which is kind of what the free energy thing feels like it's claiming. It's probably reasonable to describe different groups of researchers as being in that division, like people who really are free energy people versus people who just think predictive coding is a decent framework to understand the brain. And then within the people who think that predictive coding is a decent framework, there are people who actually believe in a particular type of mechanism and other people who just believe that you can analyze some data from that framework. Yeah, I think that's roughly what I'd say. I don't, I don't know how to talk about the free energy idea. I feel like I must not understand it because it seems crazy to me that no, it's just... that might be. <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems like there's no way it could not be true in the way that it's proposed. Yeah, no, I think, I think there's a way in which it seems obviously false if you think people like organisms want to explore and aren't trying to reduce their, um, their error. And then there are ways where it's obviously true if you formulate it a different way, which is a bad sign um, because things that can explain a lot don't end up explaining anything. Um, but then that's also kind of the quality that's required for something to be a grand unifying theory, which is what people refer to this free energy idea as sometimes. I think that the whole notion of searching for grand unified theories is uh, problematic on its own, so that's why I don't care for this one. <laughs> but I don't think I would care for any uh, grand unifying theory. But in physics, like a grand unified theory is very specific and it still makes very specific predictions and it's very mechanistic and I keep the reason I go back to that is because then it's obviously falsifiable. Oh yeah, in physics, I think that they can pull that stuff off. I don't think that there will be a grand unifying theory of the brain. And I think when you search for that, you end up getting very vague and producing things that, yes, they can describe everything about the brain because they can describe everything about everything. I feel like I've come off as a reluctant defendant of this. And perhaps, you know... I don't know if I performed adequately at that uh, responsibility. I, I guess I, I partly introduced this weak versus strong predictive coding because, like, I think that there's a reasonable but weak claim to be made here, which is, like, as we kind of all accepted, like, roughly speaking, it's kind of obvious that the brain is making predictions. And so coming at this from the perspective, not uh, not from neuroscience, but, like, from cognitive science or philosophy, it's more of the statement, it seems true that we make predictions and we can hypothesize or speculate about the benefits at a mechanistic level if you had a system that made predictions. And then the question becomes, to what extent and where and how is that implemented neurally? And I think I agree, the evidence for that isn't in yet, but like, if we accept that at like a cognitive level, we're doing like we are frequently making predictions and using those predictions to inform our behavior and subsequent perception of reality, then like, there it has to be the case that the brain is implementing it at least at some level, not necessarily at the level of a microcircuit or single neurons, though possibly in certain systems. And so I, I don't I'm not trying to make I'm trying to make the weak claim, which is. Probably the brain at some level of abstraction, possibly at the level of single, single neurons, possibly at the level of populations of neurons, is making predictions and computing errors. And those messages are presumably transmitted, at least in some cases, because it makes sense to from like an efficient coding standpoint. I think we all agree that that's happening at some level. And for me, the question's not single cell or population, but really what stage. So I agree that's happening in more conscious areas or higher cortex. I don't see any evidence of that happening in uh, like V1, much less the retina. And I agree with that. And I would further say that um, I think people should read this Andy Clark piece because we really didn't talk about much of the specifics in it. Um, so to give you know the theories and the evidence a fair shake, people should look at that. There was also um, a book chapter that I found that was pretty good, and I will link to that on the website. And um, NYU recently had a debate or like a panel discussion about predictive coding, and Andy Clark was one of the people on that, and there's a video of it, and I will link to that as well. I will also say that I think I was right to be nervous about this topic. This was difficult. <laughs> So uh, with that, I think that's everything.
Until next time. Hey, if you're still listening to this, you must really like us. So how about you go to iTunes or Stitcher and rate the podcast, give us some feedback. You can also go to our website, unsupervisedthinkingpodcast.blogspot.com. You can comment on different episodes, or you could give us ideas for new topics you want to hear about. We would love to hear from you. Thanks. Thank you.